Welcome. Welcome to North Question and thank you for selecting us as the school for your children. This is an important decision. The purpose of this address is for me to be open and honest with you about the school so you can be absolutely sure the school is right for your child and you can support us in our procedures and habits. So this is the final test drive before you commit to the purchase. The measuring of the rooms before you sign the mortgage. The romantic meal before she or he says, I will. I'm serious about this because running a school is complex. There will be nearly 700 different sets of families, each with their own histories, philosophies, capabilities, financial burdens, family dynamics, and so on. And we have to ensure the children conform to our way of doing things. We call this the Kestrian way. There is therefore from the onset an apparent contradiction. We look after individuals. It's the school's tagline where individuals thrive. Yet we always consider the wider community. But you as parents are fundamentally only interested in your child. As a parent myself, I have sat through hours of school speech nights and university award evenings, but I'm really only interested in the few minutes it takes for my sons and daughter to walk on stage, shake hands, remember shaking hands, and collect their certificates. We all want a good, disciplined environment for our children, but we defend our child when they're being disciplined. I get that. However, the philosophy we adopt is, you don't help the bee by hurting the hive. What does this mean? A five minute conversation with a child at the end of a lesson, discussing sensible things, may feel right and caring. But if this means the teacher is distracted from supervising the children as they go along corridors, or they leave the room in a mess, then the school is diminished. In the long run, this does the school and each individual in it no good, including your child. But how does this look? Your child tries to have a conversation with the teacher at the end of the lesson, but the teacher says, I can't chat now, come back at break time. The pupil sees this as an affront and at home tells his parents, Mr Smith told me to go away and all I wanted to do was to talk to him about my classwork. Parents hear this and get the impression of a rude and uncaring teacher. But in actual fact, by remaining focused on the task of looking after the hive, by ensuring the room is tidy, corridors are calm and pupils are ready to work, the teacher has looked after your child in a far bigger sense. This is why we spend a long time and repeatedly instructing our pupils in the correct protocols. And this is why I want to spend this address explaining the serious business of the Kestrian Way. The Kestrian Way has three strands, the Kestrian ABC, academic, behavior, character. The Kestrian academic. I have been teaching now for 34 years and have seen most trends come and go. Some my instinct ignored. Some I was obliged to do as part of school policy. Some I ascribed to because I was young and naive. But in the end, as headmaster, I have aligned the school to what is termed a knowledge-based curriculum. It's interesting to see that this is gaining leverage in the education community and with Ofsted. We've been embracing it in earnest for three years and we believe it is, is continuing to drive improvements in outcomes. So what does this actually mean? Firstly, most lessons will involve direct instruction. Just tell them. Imagine, if you will, the popular screenwriter's version of a lesson. The teacher sits on the edge of the desk and poses the challenging question. What are the advantages of funding and supporting space travel? 
The teacher at this point shows a PowerPoint of space rocket, Elon Musk, Mars, etc. Then comes the instructions. Put yourself into pairs or threes. Can we have four? Now discuss why you think we should fund space travel. And you, as parents, may wish to pause and think some for yourself. Then there's a few minutes chatting amongst the children. And then the teacher has to bring the class to order. And then asks for contributions. Some good answers. Some weird. To protect us from aliens. Of course, the teacher doesn't want to undermine the effort made in giving an answer, but equally doesn't want to waste time chatting about an imminent alien invasion. So the teacher then writes some answers on the board, asks pupils to select what they consider to be the best answers and why, which is always hard, and copy into their exercise book. You can see it gives the appearance of an interesting and engaging lesson. But in reality, some good ideas have been ignored. Some discussions were off task. It took time to explain the instructions and bring them to order. Some ideas were repeated. Some ideas weren't very good. And then the teacher says, and now we consider why you don't think we should fund space travel. And the whole process begins again, but this time with a little less enthusiasm. So with seven minutes to go to the end of the lesson, the teacher eventually gets to the nub of the lesson, should governments fund space travel? Reach your own conclusion. In educational terms, this sort of question is regarded as high demand. It is evaluative and judgmental in nature. But because there is little left of the lesson, the teacher sets the task for homework. The most challenging aspect of the lesson is left to the pupils and parents' own devices. It's no wonder teachers often struggle to get homework returned to a decent standard when the pupils don't know where to begin. So the Kestrian academic way is to tell the pupils what they need to know. So here are some advantages of funding space travel. There's zero gravity experiments that can be made. It helps to fund spin-off technological developments elsewhere. It promotes satellite communication and it fulfills mankind's desire to explore. Here are some disadvantages. The cost is very high and could be used for the betterment of Earth in different areas, for example, hospitals. Maybe we should explore other parts of the planet first, such as the oceans. And indeed, private individuals like Elon Musk can afford to pay for themselves. Now by giving the pupils the knowledge directly, time is used much more effectively. Vocabulary can be extended and real life examples can be prepared to illustrate. Giving knowledge is but the first step however. It has to be learned. So the second aspect of the question academic way is the use of PrEP for homework. PrEP stands for preparation and it means pupils learn the basic knowledge to help them understand and make rapid progress in the subsequent lesson, where the expert teacher, expertise of the teacher can be utilised. During a drive from Devon, I was listening to a radio programme about the music of Motown, in particular the role of producer Berry Gordy. Now apparently in 1970, he signed up an inventor of an electronic music writing device. I was intrigued. This was interesting. I must find out more, I said to myself. Needless to say, the programme and the journey moved on, and the interesting fact left my head. I can neither remember the inventor nor the name of his invention. The information is useless unless it can be recalled. So we explicitly teach pupils how to properly learn things so they can have them stored in their long-term memory and recall them when they are needed. The third aspect is our use of knowledge atlases. The basic bits of knowledge have been distilled and curated by teachers and placed in a central source for each pupil, the knowledge atlas. Each pupil is given one of these and this is key to prep. Each evening, 
The pupil is expected to learn maybe four or five key elements per lesson from the atlas to prepare them for the next lesson in that subject. So in any evening, a child may expect to be given four or five subjects prepped to learn. We expect them to spend about 50 minutes per subject, so perhaps maybe 50, 60 to 75 minutes per evening, learning those elements. And because they are straightforward, you can support your child. Test them. Can they recall? It's not as easy as it sounds. Can you, as parents, now recall the advantages and disadvantages from the list earlier? So the start of each lesson begins with a quick test of the prep. The tests are quick, designed for success with no tricks, and helps to secure the knowledge in the long-term memory. The lesson can then quickly progress to deeper application, more complexity, and in the end, more rewarding learning, stretching the most able, yet accessible for all, because the basic language has been mastered. The Knowledge Atlas is a major requirement for each lesson. Pupils are given theirs at the start of the year, along with a messenger bag to carry it, their stationery, daily reader and prep exercise book. The fourth element is feedback, that we call purple penning. Research shows that most pupils are only interested in their mark and don't respond to feedback. Here, we develop the skills of self-evaluation. Considerable time is given to pupils using guidance from the teacher to evaluate their own work, purple penning. It involves metacognition. This means, the answer was 12, not 15. Well, that's merely a correction. Metacognition is, I got the answer wrong because I now realise I missed a line out in my calculation. The pupils therefore develop an awareness of what they need to do to improve and to make progress. The fifth element is sequencing and interleaving. All lessons follow a similar pattern. Prep quiz, activity or recall, application and then consolidation. There is a stepped build-up leading to the higher order skills. It's then good brain exercise to change activities. Can you still recall the advantages and disadvantages of space travel? By continually revisiting the learned material, it becomes hardwired, easier to recall, and it allows the brain to deal with more complex material. The sixth element is cognitive science. Without recall, nothing has been learned. The brain has a very good long-term memory, but poor short-term working memory. It quickly gets cognitive overload if it's trying to work out too much at one point. So the easier it is to fetch stuff from, from it in its long-term store, the more working memory is freed up to do the complex work. Recall is vital. Cognitive science identifies four elements to successful memory recall. Relevance. What's the significance to me to what I'm doing, to my life. Repetition, repeat, repeat, repeat. Spacing, leave gaps, do things in between, forgetting the things in order to help memorise them. And finally, testing, enforcing the brain to dredge things up from the memory, you are actually learning. The frequent tests are non-threatening, they are part of the learning process, not the result. The feedback is there more to guide than grade, so you know what to do to improve. Because it's simple and easily tested, it's easier to be successful, and that means the pupils feel better. We deliberately try to make it so pupils achieve success for most of the time. Then when they apply the knowledge within their lesson, they can see its relevance. The seventh element is accountability. We adopt the all pupils can succeed approach and there can be no excuses. Not all pupils are the same, thank God. And not all pupils have the same advantages and not all pupils can cope with learning in the same way. 
But in the end, these pupils will go on to higher education, apprenticeships, universities, colleges and jobs and so on. Our job is to be a lamppost for them. You can see this in two ways. Too often, the lamppost is seen as something to lean against, a support, a prop. But take it away and you fall, cling to it and you never move on. Rather, the fundamental job of the lamppost is to illuminate. All pupils, all pupils need this to some degree or another. Something to show them the way. Some need it more and we will do this for them. But in the end, we cannot do the pupils' jobs for them. If we let their circumstances dictate their accountability, we are doing them a disservice. The lamppost can show them the way, but they have to stop leaning on it. And speaking of accountability, at North Kestrian, we have a no hands up rule. Obviously, for specific questions, who has brought their letter in, or for them to ask a question, hands up are fine. But in holding to account for their learning, teachers will pose the question, pause to let some thinking time elapse, and then pounce on a pupil. All children are thereby held to account for their learning, not just the ones who know they know. The Kestrian academic way has many more aspects to it, and pupils and parents will receive guides on how best to support each other. The B element of our ABC is Kestrian behaviour. Good behaviour is the bedrock of a good school. I want to explain a few things so that it's completely unambiguous and you can support us in our endeavours. Pupil behaviour at North Kestrian is good and this allows pupils to get on with the serious business of learning. How do we achieve this? Children are children and will push boundaries and challenge authority, at the same time as needing clear boundaries, rules and expectations. It isn't rocket science. We have developed and continue to develop and modify a set of clear rules and very high expectations that we insist on. The keys are consistency, clarity and consequence. The rules are simple and repeated and adhered to by everyone with a common methodology in the way that they're delivered. We have a mantra of slant that we embed in every child. Sit up straight in lessons, no slouching. Listen carefully at all time to the teacher and fellow pupils. Ask and answer questions. Participate fully in the lesson. Never interrupt. This is rude and disrespectful and track the teacher, pay full attention and be active in all your learning. Between lessons, we insist on walking on the left-hand side, single line, in silence. And we mean silence, not quiet, by whose standard, or simply no talking. Well, whistling isn't talking, sir. We mean silence. Clear routines at the start and the end of each lesson. Absolutely no mobile phone use, turned off and away. Uniform worn smartly and fully. Another way we achieve this is by drilling. What this means is we practice until the high expectations are met. We test the pupils on the rules so there's no excuses. We make sure our pupils know the core values of the school. Hard work, fairness, honesty because they act as our benchmark. We give them a sense of purpose to take to heart the school's mission for all pupils to thrive and go on to lead rich and fulfilling lives. And we give them the mental strength, the grit to achieve that, embedded in the school's motto, Dilapsus Resurgum, when I fall, I shall arise. By constantly referring back to these key items, we create a common purpose and set of values we all pull together. And together means pupils, teachers, parents, the triangle of strength. And this is why I'm being absolutely open with you, because in order to create a fantastic school, the Kestrian behaviours 
have to apply to every pupil. So when your son or daughter has their phone out for the second time, this means it is removed and confiscated for five school days. So when they go home distressed, I really need my phone, I won't be safe, I've got to go out tonight, etc. I want your response to be, you knew the rules, you had a warning, tough, you'll have to stay in. If you can't back us up in this way, then maybe we're not the school for your son or daughter. Trust us, we're not ogres. And remember, children don't always tell the full truth. I'm in detention, yet it was John who pushed me over. Usually means something like, John pushed me over because I called him a something. And now I'm in detention. And yes, John too will have been sanctioned. About our sanctions and rewards. We have a clear conscience sca a consequence scale, the C scale. So that pupils take responsibility for their actions. It's important that the transgression and the consequence are aligned. So we have same night detentions. We have lunchtime, evening and Saturday detentions. We have community work, litter picking, chewing gum scraping. We have extra work or lines. We have internal and external exclusion, including permanent exclusion. We have alternative provision, the use of another school. We have report cards. Pupils may be denied access to school functions or trips. We may use restorative justice. But within all this is the aim simply to manage behaviour. And your unequivocal support is essential. Rewards. Our expectations are unashamedly high. So the norm is a very calm and quiet, sometimes eerily quiet, school. So it's no surprise that positive achievement points outweigh negative achievement points, typically by five to one. This says two things. Firstly, are pupils doing the things that we approve of? And secondly, our staff are keen to recognise and reward correct behaviour. So we have positive standards cards, postcards that go home for bronze, silver, gold and platinum, newsletter announcements, certificates of achievement, termly honours assembly, prefit roles and so on. But the rewards are an acknowledgement rather than a prize. Some of you will remember before the advent of Strictly, the BBC programme The Generation Game, at one time presented by Bruce Forsyth. Notorious with the poor prizes, bedside, la bedside lamp, picnic basket and of course a cuddly toy. One time Bruce Forsyth approached the BBC head of light entertainment Bill Cotton to ask for more expensive prizes. Bill Cotton refused saying if the prizes were substantial the contestants would stop having fun and simply strive for the winnings instead thereby ruining the feel of the show. He was right. Here we reward to say thanks rather than to entice. Channels of communication. From time to time you may have a concern or inquiry. In general the first port of call is the form tutor unless it's about a specific subject related matter. Then speak to the lesson teacher. Remember however staff are very busy and they have just six non-teaching periods per fortnight. Therefore, it's best to ring in and make an appointment to speak to the member of staff. Parents' evening. There are two types, COVID notwithstanding. PIEs are our parent information evenings. These are there to deliver key information, for example, prior to a trip or pre-option selections. Then we have PCEs, parent consultation evenings. These are the traditional parents evenings in that you will speak to a teacher about your child's academic and pastoral progress. However, these are strictly by appointment. A teacher may teach 60 to 150 pupils in a year group, meaning in a typical evening there might be less than two minutes per set of parents. This is not a good use of time. Rather, you will receive invitations to teachers 
who feel they need to speak to you and then spend quality, t- quality time discussing your child. All parents will receive invitations. Some might only see three or four teachers, others 10 or 12. You might be invited because your child's being lazy and unengaged, or they're struggling in some aspect, or they've made excellent progress and praise is needed, or there are other things like pastoral groups or focusing on things like their presentation skills or their organisational skills. Reporting home. There are three main assessment slots per year, data captures. But subjects also have topic tests and the like along the way. Furthermore, all parents and pupils have access to class charts. This tracks things like the prep that has been set, achievement points, attendance and so on. It has live notifications so you can see your child's progress regularly. Induction. Normally there would be a transition day, but unfortunately COVID has put pay to that. However, we have two induction days in September the 3rd and 4th that we affectionately term boot camp. Only the New Year 7s are in on that day. Here we really introduce the pupil to the question way and they rapidly settle and feel at home here. And now to C of the ABC, question way character. Mental health and well-being can be a cause for concern. You will pick up from this address that I'm not particularly liberal-minded. I do believe in self-determination and accountability, but these should be allied to shared responsibility for the community and the planet. My Christian faith provides me with a perspective on our place in the cosmos and my value systems. This gives me comfort and strength. I respect and admire people of all other faiths and those who have none. We are all fragile human beings and unless we walk in someone else's shoes you cannot know what is going on in their mind or indeed in their heart. So as well as the serious business of education a vital function of the school is to build the pupils' characters to ensure they can cope with all that will befall them. This will help them to fulfil the mission for them to thrive and go on to lead rich and fulfilling lives. It's right we build resilience in our pupils. We explicitly teach stoicism, a positive mental attitude, what can be done rather than what can't. We have an extensive personal development programme. Within this, pupils are taught the skills of public speaking, debate and argument and take part in things like mock trials. We expose pupils to situations that might be alien to to some. We hold high assemblies with staff and prefects in academic gowns to expressly teach the expectations of formal occasions. We expect all our pupils to speak in full sentences, be polite and courteous, to hold doors open, then wipe clean of course, and to address staff with miss or sir. Holding high office should not be the sole domain of children of public schools like Eton or Harrow. The trick is not to undermine or be critical of these schools, but to take the best bits from them and copy them in our school. In my open evening talk, I refer to pupils to be proud to talk amongst others and to stand in company, but not too proud to be able to bend to the lowly. All our pupils need to be ambitious but not arrogant, confident but not cocky, gracious but not greasy. We expect our staff to lead by example and they do. They work incredibly hard and are genuinely invested in in and care for your children. We have an excellent pastoral team. Our dictum is what might be construed as tough love. Giving children what they want is not the same as what they need. If you send your child in with bags of crisps and sweets for their lunch, then you are undermining our lessons on food and nutrition. If you send them in or provide money for water in disposable bottles, you are undermining our lessons and protecting the environment. We promote cycling to school. We have purpose-built shelters, but only if they wear helmets. Our rules may appear killjoy or petty, but they're there for the safety, well-being and development of all. 
In developing character, we encourage sporting engagement as much as possible. We have extensive playing fields and are investing in upgrading the playing surfaces. We have employed an additional PE teacher to encourage the take-up of sport further. Likewise, in music, performing arts and public speaking, skills honed in these areas are so valuable in enriching life and providing valuable tools to develop the whole person. So my concluding remarks. We give serious thoughts to our practices and procedures to create a school that is disciplined because that creates boundaries, focused because that creates clarity, knowledge-based because that leads to creativity, hive-centred because that looks after the bees. This can only be done with 100% buy-in from you as parents. When children are secure in their boundaries, know where they're going because of clarity, can flourish creatively because of their knowledge and feel cared for as an individual within the community, then such children are happy. We look forward to seeing them all on September the 3rd. Thank you.